By the time the war ended, five of my classmates were dead. All healthy 18, 19 year old, 20 year old guys, you know. And that's the problem with war. But you've got to get over that. The next day there's another mission coming up. George E. Hardy, H-A-R-D-Y, Lieutenant Colonel, United States Air Force, retired. In World War II, I was in the United States Army. In 1947, when the Air Force became a separate service, I moved with them to the United States Air Force. Well, I graduated from high school in uh, June 1942, and war was going on. Six months earlier, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. But I turned 17 the same month I graduated. In 1942, I had to wait for a year to go in. And it's good I waited that year because during that year I decided I wanted to fly. It wasn't so long ago these men were students in a university, workmen in a shipyard, just plain citizens from everywhere USA. They didn't know what the future would be, but many hoped they'd get the chance to fly and fight in the air. Some wanted that chance more than anything in the world. I went to Tuskegee Institute, uh, 320th College Training Detachment. They stuck in five months of college work for us high school guys. And I went to Tuskegee for we were three months before they cut that short, and I entered aviation cadet training in December 1943. And graduated in September 1944 as a second lieutenant and a pilot. Here's the answer to Adolf and Hirohito. Here's the answer to the propaganda of the Japs and Nazis. Here's the answer wings for this man, wings for these Americans. I got training in different types of airplanes. I got training in a P-40. I went to gunnery training at, at Tuskegee. Then I moved to Wallaburg, South Carolina, where I trained in a P-47, combat training in a fighter airplane. P-47 was a very good airplane, and uh, our instructors were people who had flown the P-47 in combat in Europe. When we went through training, uh, there was no white pilots with us. We, our instructors were white, say. In most cases, that isn't basic advanced. In primary, we had all black instructors or civilian instructors. But in basic advanced, we had white army instructors. And I would say that I got along so well with my instructor, I thought he did a good job. He was really conscientious. And most of the instructors I talked to were conscientious, I thought. They did a good job to turn out a good product. I, I really love my instructors, especially the one in advance, Lieutenant Peacock. He was a, just a, he was conscientious. He seemed to worry so much about me. I love the P-47, but it's a, it's a bulky airplane. Uh, and once you get it up at altitude and get airspeed up, it's a damn good airplane. And we got about 60 some hours in the P-47, then we shipped overseas in February 45. Overseas, we transitioned into the P-51. But the P-51 seemed much more nimble and much more responsive. It's a cheese, I, I'm 19 years old, I'm driving a Rolls, you know, it, it, it's, it's living, you know. Second Lieutenant, you couldn't beat that, so. And then flying formation. And uh, I fit right in with them and uh, I thought I was a good formation flyer. I was assigned to the 99th Fighter Squadron 332nd Fighter Group at Ramatelli Air Base in Italy. Uh, March and April, I flew 21 combat missions with the 99th Fighter Squadron. Most of my missions were high altitude escort missions. And by the time I got over there, I didn't have many German airplanes around. On the missions I was on, we didn't tangle with them, or they didn't come in and attack us. So the only time I fired my guns was on strafing missions. After escorting the bombers, if we had fuel left, we would go back over Germany looking for targets of opportunity. Anything on the highways or on the railroad tracks, trains, we just kept trains, destroyed them if we could, because they no doubt were carrying munitions, war materials, and or barges on rivers. And that's the time I fired my guns on strafing missions. The only airplanes we saw in the air were the jets. What was that? What the hell was that? It went by like we were standing still. 
Blue leader to group. Get off the air. Going by at 2 o'clock. What the hell is it? The ME-262 is a turbojet plane whose operation resembles a rocket. It uses the turbine only to operate the air compressor to supply oxygen to the engine. Propulsion is provided by expansion of gases in the combustion chamber, as in a rocket jet. The ME-262 is a single-seat fighter bomber with two turbojet units underslung and projecting beyond leading and trailing edges. Four 30-millimeter guns are grouped in the nose of the fuselage. Length about 35 feet, span about 41. Pointed nose, very slender at the rear. It has a single fin and rudder of large area. The tail plane is set high on the fuselage. Maximum speed between 10 and 30,000 feet, about 500 miles an hour. Requires a large turning circle. Can be outturned by American and British fighters. The only thing about the jet was it was much faster than we were. Our plane was more agile. When a mission to Berlin, we shot down three of those 262s. And uh, they would come in and attack us, and our planes were able to turn quickly on them and get them, fire at them before they got out of range. And he shot down three of them on that uh, mission. So uh, they were vulnerable in that respect. Plus, one other thing is uh, they didn't have many of them, and the pilots only had so much training in them, see? Because by that time, Germany was running out of pilots and airplanes. And they didn't have space to train them. Anytime they had an airplane on an airfield someplace, we'd shoot it up. So we had air superiority. So it was, it was a dying effort on their part at that time. I didn't see a Heinkel or a, I didn't see a 109 or, or 190 on any of the missions I was on. See, they were running out of airplanes by that time. So remember, they couldn't train any place, people any place. Uh, any airport in the country, we were flying over and would shoot them up. My first experience when I, I, those things I saw were shells coming back at us were strafing some tanks, and they were firing back at us. And it was the first time I saw it, I didn't know what it was in the first place, but it was shells coming back at us. And I was hit once, thought it was worse than it was because I saw this bright light in the plane. The shell came through the side of the plane. 88 guns, they were normally used for, uh, to fire at the bombers. And we would escort the bombers, but when the bombers reached the target, that's when they would, the target would be defended normally, say. And when that happened, we would pull off to the side and let them go through the target and meet them on the other side. And I was amazed at how uh, many shells would come up and those B-17s would just keep formation and fly right through all those black bursts. You didn't hear anything, you just saw the bursts. Thing. We lost some people, but that happens. It's a wartime, you've got to realize that. And that's part of the problem, you know, with wartime. It's not as glamorous as some people play it up to be because some people pay the price, see. By the time the war ended, what, five of my classmates were dead uh, to a couple through accidents and three during the war. So uh, it takes a toll, you know, and all healthy 18, 19 year old, 20 year old guys, you know. And that's the price of war. Uh, one of my roommates was killed overseas. Uh, I went to cadets on John Squires. He was killed overseas. So uh, what he was uh, 19 years old when he was, no, he was 20 when he was killed. And uh, such a promising life for him, you know, and suddenly it's ended, you know. And that's the problem with war. And, uh, but you've got to get over that. The next day there's another mission coming up. So that's the price you pay. But when the war ended, we were just glad that it was over, you know. And hopefully the rest of it could get back because separation from families, interruption of education, all of that. The war is still going on with Japan, but fortunately that ended in, the, in, in August of 1945, so. In fact, that was on the, the water coming back when that did end in 45. 14 August, 1945, VJ Day. The Second World War at last is over. With the surrender of Japan comes the great moment of joyous relief. After years of the anxieties and grief and horrors of universal war. I got out of the service in 1946. To me, I always thought the Army's number one goal was segregation. Number two was winning a war. And that's the way it appeared to me because they, it was amazing how they were, had rules in place 
to ensure segregation took place wherever you went. And I got through okay. Under the feet of these men, a new road is being beaten out. Broad enough now for thousands and ten thousands. A good road for our country. These men remember that, marching or flying. They remember backing them up, their families, their friends, who expect so much of them. And backing them up, the men and women of every creed and speech and color who made these planes. And backing them up, the most powerful force in the world, the strength of the American people. Hi, Ben here from the World War II Veterans History Project, and thank you for watching this episode of World War II As They Saw It. If you enjoyed the video, click the like button down below and consider subscribing to our channel for more historical content. And be sure to click the notification bell to stay up to date on all our latest videos. If you'd like to support the efforts of the World War II Veterans History Project and keep this series going, please consider supporting us on Patreon for as little as $1 a month. The link is in the description below. Thanks again for watching this episode of World War II as they saw it. We hope to see you again soon.